Welcome everyone, Ted Rawson here to Think Tech Studios downtown Honolulu with three excellent guests. Uh, we'll get to them in a minute. Our show is Where the Road Leads, as you know, because you faithful followers have been learning from us and working with us on this subject for some time. Where the Road Leads, we talked the last several times about some of the issues taking place in the hurricane response in, in Puna. Uh, today we're going to talk a little bit about what we might see in the future here in terms of how that road is guided by lots of information coming in from multiple sources and from multiple systems and how we have to make sense out of it all, in particular what's going to happen in about two weeks in Pahoa. So we're talking about technology and how technology can make a difference here in Hawaii and Hawaii can lead the rest of the Pacific Rim in some of these regards. Technology isn't just systems and complicated electronics, it's also people working together, it's also relationship building and these other factors which are really the art of solving a problem as well as the specific circuit boards to solve a problem. Just before we get started with today's show though, just as a reminder, what we knew from the last couple of shows is that Manoa is going to have its Be Ready Manoa uh, Emergency Preparedness Readiness Show tomorrow, 9 to 2, at the Manoa District Park, and some of us will be up there, and uh, it's on the 13th tomorrow. Kailua will have its uh, equivalent readiness show, 10 to 1, at the center parking lot in the middle of Kailua Town on the 27th. We'll get somebody from Kailua in here on the 26th, and we'll talk about that show at that time. But maybe most important of all, uh, Pahoa is having a lava readiness fair tomorrow at the high school in Pahoa. So for you who are on the Big Island who are concerned about that coming event, uh, get on down there to the high school tomorrow and participate in the, uh, in the lava readiness fair. Ian, if you know something about that, perhaps you can even speak to us on that. One of our colleagues who's a veteran from this show, Nick Turner at University of Hawaii Hilo, is actually out in the field right now doing inventory on um, factors that might in the topography that might affect the lava flow. Otherwise, he'd be telling us what's taking place at the uh, readiness fair. But you can anybody who needs to can get a hold of Nick Turner at the following phone number, if you're ready to write it down, 808-214-0648 for questions and participation in the readiness fair tomorrow, lava readiness fair in Pahoa. That's serious stuff. What we're talking about is response coordination. And that will be something that will be tested yet again in the, in the upcoming events in, uh, in Pahoa. But response coordination came to our collective uh, witness here a couple of weeks ago as we are talking about the, the system that uh, Ian deals with, which is called Mercy, or My Mercy, coming out of uh, Ocean, which is an information collection and, and inventory system. Uh, we have, uh, we've had somebody from Rubicon now before, Terry uh, Rivera, I'm talking about... Uh, about the uh, the uh, palliative system Correct. that's used, similar to that yep. to what's used in uh, in the, in the state civil defense, and what strikes me, and I've heard this from other people as well, is that more and more as we go on, Android phones and iPhones are going to have capability in them that'll be useful to extract information and feed it forward into some domain where it should be analyzed. For example, this UAV right here. Everybody's seen this before on the show, perhaps. So this is an example of what's coming. There's a piece of technology with it with cameras on it. I think the audience may be able to see the our camera here. This is a down this is the ground station that receives video feedback from the, the UAV. So here's another example of the kind of technology that's coming that's going to generate this flow of uh, of information coming forward. And the issue with information coming forward is the expectations that ride upon it. If people out there with through their own efforts are putting information into a system or into the into the ether, they're going to expect someone to deal with it. So we have the issue of the flow building up of information. Someone has to receive it and do something with it, analyze it, decide what action to take, take the action, and perhaps even inform the people who generated the information that the action's underway. Complicated subject when you have all these different systems that can collect information and can share it forward and then store it. So without uh, further ado, let me introduce three experts who are in the middle of that circumstance and situation right now, each one backed by a strong uh, organization we could call upon for future sessions here at the table. But to my immediate left, we have John Chung from Team Rubicon, a uh, veteran from uh, many uh, international DOD activities and, and <laughs> such, and now putting that work, uh, that experience to use in the civil environment. Pleasure to be here. We have uh, David Takeyama from uh, Oceanit. 
and next to him, I am Peter Jima from uh, Oceanid as well, and you've talked about Mercy last time. We'll hear about it more this time. Next time we'll get Rubicon to bring the uh, Palantir we'll bring our toys on. next time. Let's do a robot wars between Palantir <laughs> and Ocean and throw the UAV into the mix. Well, so. we could see that. I mean, actually, it would just be like just a bunch of megabytes, megabits fighting each other. See who has, yes. has prettier colors. Uh, okay. that? So we, we had quite a discussion on Mercy last week at this very table. And now Manoa, the Manoa Fair is going to pick it up tomorrow. There's a lot of discussion on that line about using it in, in uh, Bahoa uh, with the uh, coming lava situation. So let's start again with you and then talk a little bit about, remind us about the, what, what the system is and how sure. it works as sure. a starter to our conversation here. So um, there's, two, there's two versions of Mercy. So there's the version called Mercy that actually is used by states of the transit. It's primarily used for field damage assessments. So basically with an iPad or some iOS device, you can go out to the field and actually collect information after a disaster. And that information is primarily for, um, primarily for civil defense, be it the county or the state or the feds. And so the, the audience for that is a certain audience. And it, and it could include, and I think in the future, what we're looking at is how do, how do we share this information with other folks who are going to the field, like the Hawaiian Electrics or the Helcos or the Board of Water Supply people or even Red Cross and others who are actually in the field and need information. But when we're but just recently we reintroduced um, a version of Mercy called My Mercy, which is a consumer version. It's actually free. It's available on the Apple App Store. And this kind of changes. It's a little bit different now. So people could actually download this app and actually document their home. Uh, their property, their possessions, um, and all of the information by default is is private. So actually right now uh, at, at the Pohoa Fair, um, Denise Layton will be um, kind of getting information about, to people about My Mercy because I think what's going to happen is that people are going to start are going to want to start documenting uh, their homes and their possessions as the, the lava flow gets closer. Um, but you can what you can also do with the app is you can actually make reports and make those reports public. So you could actually, the, the community there could could actually help us to understand, for example, in, in the case of Pohoa and the Puna area, is just the Albizia trees. So if you still have a tree near your home that looks like it's a little precarious and could, could actually fall and maybe hit the wires again and take out the power again or damage your home, you could use this app to actually document it, make that information public. And then that information is available to all of us, including state civil defense or county people. And so again, crowdsourcing the information all of a sudden is in the hands of the community. Because the thing we learned as we were there with folks was the, and the community showed us was they were the first responders. That's fascinating. So the community can determine its own condition, pass that information forward, and then again the expectations are set that something's going to happen because of it. So we right. have that new demand upon the response system to be responsive to that collected information. Right. I think you know, we had a hard time getting information. Let's turn to our uh, resident responder right here, yep. uh, John Chung from Rubicon. How do you guys, as actual boots on the ground responders? Well, well actually, that's funny that you mentioned that because part of our AER after action or after action report uh, we did after uh, what for us we call Operation Steadfast, which was the Puna recovery. Uh, one of the things that we talked about was uh, how to utilize people that we actually have on the ground on the Big Island because we actually had some team mm -hmm. volunteers on the ground out there now. <clears throat> One thing that uh, some of the other uh, volunteers did on the other islands, say for instance on Maui, uh, they were very proactive on that. We didn't ask them to. We don't. Um, our first, as an organization, uh, state organization, uh, to include it, is to, when a disaster strikes, is to make sure that our personnel is okay. Then, based on uh, the, the circumstances with the state uh, agencies, other disaster uh, response agencies, then we t try to develop where our role is as an organization. But when it comes to our people on the ground, our first concern is, are they okay? We don't tell them, oh, well, go out and let's get some information now just to be prepared for a mission. That does come later. But in this case, we had people on the ground and some of the other ones that were actually feeding it, proactively feeding us information on what was going on. That was immensely useful. And because part of what our personnel did when we hit the, hit the ground a week after the hurricane actually hit, um, or I should say it's tropical storm, or whatever they want to call it now, but after the need for assistance in Puna was identified, 
uh, by that point, a significant amount of time had passed, and so by the time we actually had people on the ground uh, doing assessments, getting eyes, and uh, converting those into uh, assessments that we could utilize to create work orders, a, a week had already passed. When really we actually had people on the ground that could have fed information through pictures, information, and then remotely utilize that. And that's, that's what they're to Yeah, that's what, that's what they're C rep, and she was collecting data from EMOS, which I think uh, is interoperable with my Mercy, or Mercy, I we think. We were probably yeah. sending, yeah, we were exporting was, data yeah, out yeah. that I think was going into, into these yeah. other systems. Right. That maybe it was getting so control. we're kind of drawing a picture in our mind of what the information flow <coughs> architecture is right here at the table, as if we're drawing a play in the dirt, right? right. This is interesting. So we're, this is like cell forming uh, ad hoc operations. Um, how do we how do we sort of formalize that or push it forward quicker so that information you're generating is known to John in a faster manner and information requirements you need or subjects you need he can feed to I, I think it's funny I think it's finding a uh, I guess a format that has a common denominator to everything and this in this particular case my from my observation uh, it seemed like email I don't even know what EMOP, if you have to know what it stands for, it's, it is a database system, I, I believe that's maintained by the uh, Pacific Disaster Center, which is what they use to display uh, current status and locations and any, any information regarding uh, 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 disasters uh, globally. Uh, and that seems to share, be able to share data, uh, just raw data, between our Palantir system, which is actually technically a uh, proprietary system developed by a company by the same name. Uh, who they just happen to allow us to use, and would, uh, but has capability uh, to at least share the same similar data as um, Mercy. So it's it's common, I guess, a common ground for that. Um, in my opinion, just as a layman's opinion, uh, I think there's always going to be some disparity between developing technologies because that's how innovation happens. Uh, if everything was, uh, everyone said, "Well, you're going to do it this," speaking from a, go a former government employee. Um, it was militarization of standards that kind of hindered uh, progress, technology, innovation. Uh, it wasn't until the, the, the government and the military in general kind of said, let's not mill spec, okay, let's get away from mill spec and go more towards uh, intent and uh, innovation, that we kind of see even recent developments uh, in regards to that. However, the caveat to that is that they have now have developed different competing systems against each other and how do we all make it work together? That's always, that's, is bringing it back together again, that's, that's been the challenge. That's exactly yeah. what we want to talk about. For example, this system here is uh, going to feed out through a, a VCN jack on the back and mm -hmm. you want to push it out beyond here in mm -hmm. some place where a larger audience can use it. So we'd have to have figured that out in advance. Let's uh, pick up that theme of that, uh, the common denominator, the database, the EMUX, I think you called e it. EMUX, yeah. E I'll have to that, find, uh, make sure I know what it is next time. And I think we're going to get somebody from PDC at this table based on <laughs> that, and they can blame you. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, that, and, uh, yeah that's and what I'm here for. After we take the break, but the second thing we'll talk about after break is innovation and where that fits into the equation. You brought that up as a way we're going to have to move forward here as opposed to getting stagnant yeah. in, a, in a certain solution. And David, you're sort of at the middle of that, I think, so. We'll have a great conversation in about 30 seconds when we're back from break. All right. Aloha. Welcome to ThinkTech Hawaii. My name is Josh Green. I'm the host of a program called Healthcare in Hawaii. I'm a physician. I work in the emergency department on the Big Island. I also serve in the state senate, which, please don't hold that against me, doesn't detract from my television program. We speak about all the big health care issues in the state. We get together on Tuesdays from 2 o'clock till 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And we try to talk about the most important issues in health care. This is a terrific venue for people to learn about health care. There are many programs on this, on this station. We broadcast it later, uh, not just on the Internet, but also on OC16. Thanks for joining us. Please be informed health care consumers. Ted Rawson again with you, uh, with our guest here this afternoon at Think Tech Hawaii and Where the Road Leads. We have uh, John Chung, we have David Takayama, we have Ian Kitajima, 
uh, who have been going through a discovery process here of the various different perspectives of the kinds of dynamic situations that they've experienced recently in, in natural disasters and which we can expect more of. And we've had several discoveries in the last 15 minutes of discussion. One of them is we don't know what the, quite, quite the name of the PDC database common denominator is, and we'll promise to bring you that next time. And we'll actually trap somebody from PDC and get them to explain how that all works, and maybe have you guys here too and get how it all works together. But we talked, you, you, John, you led into the idea of innovation as being a way to move forward here as we face these complex issues. And David, you're a chief technical officer at OSHIN, are you not in, in a capacity of that type? Yeah. So how do you, as a, as a scientist and technology generator or developer, handle all these disparate types of requirements that aren't articulated necessarily in a standard requirement set, but are you can sort of tell what they are? Tell us how you think that's going to work in this complex dynamic environment from an innovation perspective. I think it's interesting because in the field of you know, emergency management, like maybe about five years ago when we first got started, the emergency management agencies were very conservative. Like they wanted to be the ones that collected the information, didn't want to rely on the public. But I think as social media became, the, you know, more pre prevalent and um, different apps, you know, innovative apps like My Mercy and other apps have come onto the market. They recognize the value um, of these apps and innovation and how it can help them. And now, you know, the challenge is being able to gather all this disparate information from different sources and make meaning out of it. And we found from the Pune incident, you know, one of the problems is that, you know, if you're you come out with a team maybe a week later, what happens is the community, they start fixing stuff on, by themselves. And if that's not documented, you know, they may, you know, FEMA may come a week later and may not see anything because the community came together and fixed it already. And so, you know, if they have tools to document it, you know, at that time, it's a, you know, of a great value. And I think the challenge now is um, being able to pull together that disparate information and make meaning out of it because you have information coming from multiple different sources and that those are unverified information, but it's very good sources. And so there's the process of being able to data mine that information. So you're saying something interesting here. You're saying you're, you've seen a transition from a very conservative approach with all the formal deconfliction and correlation and all the issues that came out of the intelligence community. You're seeing that slacken back a little bit and deal with this less justified data, perhaps, that people have to deal with because the expectations of the people who generate that information are still there. Yeah. So this is uh, this is going to be challenging uh, for the formal structured mind to, to think about how to handle this unstructured uh, evolution of information. So seeing that that track going forward here, what I was struck by is another thing that Jonathan said here: we're moving towards the intent of the information collected rather than the information collected itself. That's almost like a language translation issue or some form of synoptic reduction of big paragraphs into single words. But, and then you added the, the time dimension to it, saying that and just because you took a picture four days ago of a, a broken water main doesn't mean the water main's still broken. Somebody may have fixed it and not documented the fact it was fixed. So what a, what a conflicting environment we have here of information, information latency, uh, and, and the actions that people are taking or, or an agency should take. And I think we heard from uh, uh, Ian from you last time, the posse's not coming. So you really have to be able to deal right. with these issues yourself as best you can. Right, right. I think, I think one of the biggest challenges is, um, is actually getting the right people together on a team. Like you have, you know, again, in my mind, if I could replay the tape and go backwards and, and know what we know now, I would have, you know, I would have, I would have suggested and I think this is part of the thing that we have to do is educate folks in the power of what these what this new information is because no one's ever had this kind of information before and, and so quick before so part of it is educating I think multiple people about the, the information that is coming in as well as the information that's now coming in from the public 
but in my mind, I would put in the middle of the room these kinds of information systems. So whatever system is actually compiling and bringing in, you know, Palantir information, Mercy data, PDC data, whatever, and going into a single system. But that becomes the picture of, from which all of these folks around the table are now kind of eating from. So if I'm the Hawaiian Electric guy, you know, and I know I have crews out there, but again, I have limited resources. I can't do it all. But if the National Guard team or the Team Rubicon guys are out there and they're already doing assessments and that information is coming into the system and I can see that, I can better plan my, my plan of attack on how I'm going to get through an area and where I'm going to get through because maybe roads already are blocked. But at least from the assessments I can see, these particular roads are open and we can start sending crews in there to start, to start doing work, whereas my other crews are going to just go in to cut through areas first and, and haul things away. So part of it is, I think, you know, kind of reconfiguring the teams around, around a table of information that I think we have now. But, you know, when we first went there, I was, we were off in like a corner because, again, really the state hadn't had a major disaster for over 20 years and no one's ever had this kind of information. So part of it is you have this very valuable information and assessments being done, but, you know, you're kind of like away from where the action is in some sense and being able to get this information. So we're always asking, like, who could use this information? But, you know, we're so far away from the rest of the core EOC team that's, that's kind of coordinating everything. But to me, this kind of stuff should be now kind of like the center point. And that, pro that feeling that you just expressed is probably common to a lot of the NGOs and the other responders who are out there. They may think that they're not in the center of the activity, that they're off on the side somewhere. So what you're searching for is that center point that can come together, to pull the information together, and uh, uh, it, it, it boggles the mind as to how to even think about that. So let's go back to David again. Not to load you up, David, or put pressure on you, but you're the technical guy on, on the three of us here, I think, or four of us if I count right. And uh, so how would we begin cracking that nut? How are we going to begin taking a look at the problem that we've heard defined here on the table and reforming that table around this more ad hoc or unstructured data flow but not losing any resolution in the process. Well, I think part of it, like, like Ian said, is that you know, we haven't had to think of data in this way before. You know, the last major, you know, it's, a, it's changed a lot since Iniki, you know, having access to social media and all these other types of, of data. So I think from a process standpoint, it could be organized better. And not to say that we were not prepared and the state was not prepared. The state was very prepared and we've, you know, the state has practiced, you know, annually with Makani Pahili exercises and other exercises. Um, but whenever there's like a live incident, it, things are different and things come up that people don't, don't think about. And so, you know, in a way that there's lessons learned that, you know, we can carry on. And part of it is a process, part of it is technology and figure out figuring out different ways to mine the data and extract you know, what's important, I think. Do you think that the way we have the uh, readiness uh, <clears throat> affairs and such needs an added component to it, which is this very issue of information sharing among all the agencies present? I mean, typically we'll see 50 or 70 different booths and different displays and such, but we don't see how they come together. At, uh, at, at the fairs. And I wonder if maybe this experience shouldn't be used to stimulate maybe the next round of fairs to start having that as a, maybe even an exercise within the fair that, that opens that door, challenges that system, whatever it might be. <coughs> but to, to highlight this, uh, can you demonstrate for us again in uh, how... Look at David. <laughs> the audience that uh, might not be familiar with this particular level of system can get an idea of what I'm talking about. Well, this is the My Mercy app. This is the one on the uh, iTunes store from Apple. Um, but as Ian mentioned, you know, there's two components for My Mercy. One is, you know, to be able to take a baseline. And this is a baseline. So, for example, um, if I want to take a baseline of my residence, um, I can enter the baseline name and then add different comments and different media. So I could take photographs of 
all my an inventory of, of my entire house. You know, uh, camera three. Yeah, we can go to. <coughs> let's just there we go. Okay. Uh, I could take an inventory of my house pre disaster. Now, once I have a baseline, and after there's let's say an incident, then I can create a new report. And you would do this as a homeowner in this case. And in this, this case, an individual. Not, you're not even tied to the network at this point. You're simply doing this with no network connectivity. Yep. <clears throat> yeah. Just you're simply doing a photographic inventory with notations and geotagging and yes. yes. time-based stamp. Mm -hmm. And then I have the ability then afterwards to create a report. And this is an assessment report where it will have different types of categories of incidences like an earthquake, flood, tsunami, etc. Um, and then I can associate a baseline with that report. So this is my test baseline. And then I can add comments and photographs. So then you can compare the before and after. And then there's also the ability to then push you, this. You could keep personal records here. You could take pictures of your checkbook, for example, could yeah. you not? Yeah, and that was kind of the, the idea of having this type of app because we want people to download it before the incident mm -hmm. because you know if you have no connectivity yeah. afterwards and yeah. what's the sense of you know you can't download the app so the idea of this was to use it for yourself personally um, and have that app available for you so then after the incident then you can you know document it and it's already on your phone so that's part of the educational concept you were bringing up earlier let's start getting these things in people's hands and start mm -hmm. getting them used and they become our standard yep. And this is part of that process of going from the very conservative to the more open view of how to manage information. Yeah. People over time will get less concerned about privacy issues and this sort of thing and, and will be willing to share pieces or parts of their reports if appropriate. And then Ian mentioned like you have the ability to to then send this. No, no connection here, but <laughs> you have the ability to send it to the cloud as either you know, a private report or a public report. So you may want to have keep your own baseline <coughs> private, but you may want to have a public report of you know some damage that was documented. Um, yeah. And you know, for <coughs> you know, I think one of the things that would have been interesting to see if, if we had this app at the time in in the Pune area, um, if you know as soon as the disaster occurred and people actually could pull this app up, up and actually start documenting the down trees the down telephone poles I mean they have to be safe but they actually could have really helped us understand um, how bad things were as well as give us information ahead of time so that again when we start to plan to come into those communities that we have a better plan versus you know we just show up and realize okay we're just totally blocked in and we don't have the right equipment or we have to have other people come in first uh, to cut through and get through to to folks there um, again I think the the ability to, or the, the ability to empower people with tools like this be it whatever systems out yeah. there to, to provide and share information about what's going on uh, will be super valuable, I think, in, in how quickly we can recover. Especially, oh, sorry, to interrupt. Uh, especially when it comes to the uh, initial information gathering, because everyone, I think, kind of understands that initial reports always be flawed or mistaken. But having some information at the outset is better than none. Uh, and there may be a bloat, but uh, that it, it paints the macro picture. And from there, you can kind of see where the uh, trouble areas are, and so you can. Uh, possibly f uh, set priorities, uh, see where a focus needs to be uh, put in, uh, to kind of dovetail on that. That's kind of where Palantir has its advantages. Uh, we, it, like I said, it is a proprietary system. Um, but, and, and the, I guess the implementation is actually on uh, specif specifically designed and, and programmed phones, uh, so they're specific as Palantir devices. Uh, there's a limited a number, unfortunately, I don't have any to, to, to show you today, but um, they are limited to certain teams. The way we organize is to set them to strike teams. Uh, strike teams being uh, small, uh, either it could be assessment, they're, they're uh, specifically, they have a cer certain focus as far as what they're supposed to do. Other assessments or work order completion could be debris removal, could be a medical team, uh, but they have a specific purpose for their. Uh, 
makeup. So it's more than just an inventory system, it's, right. uh, it's it, more of a, a structured attack plan system. Right, and their Palantir device is both a communication and uh, animal reporting system, which is in the database. Now, that's more of a surgical level, uh, to, to say, we're gonna, they're going to zero in on a specific area or, or a specific uh, neighborhood. Uh, case in point, Hurricane Sandy, uh, a, a great portion of um, New York and New Jersey were affected. Based on the inf information gathered, Team Rubicon decided to focus on the rockways and some of the less, um, uh, I guess, some of the areas that with slightly less attention than others. And that's kind of where their, their mission lies, is that trying to zone in on uh, a specific area that may not be getting them to uh, be able to be given as much attention on the macro level. So different roles, but similar uh, technology, similar purposes, and uh, both are valuable, I think, uh, especially, like, like, I mean, I think we're all in agreement, the initial information gathering was, uh, that wasn't, it, we, we missed the, the boat on that one, um, just because things were happening, and, you know, it, maybe the data was coming out from different sources, we can't parse every single one, social media, I mean, I'm sure people were talking to social media, like, man, things are looking really bad in Pune, I think it's the right eyes weren't getting there. Um, and I don't think there's really a program that can parse all the pieces of data. It's the human factor that comes in and says, you know, something's going on over there. I think you should tell somebody about it. And let's, that's part of the tool that can help. Let's do this. After the break, we'll take a break here in a, in a couple of seconds. But let's talk one step level deeper in terms of how you, as Rubicon, will oh. see the value of the information made available to you through Mercy and how the Mercy side of the house, which is basically damage assessment and such, would see the value of what's coming out of Rubicon after we come back from the break in about 30 seconds. Aloha, this is Kelee Akina. It's my privilege to be the host of Ehana Kako, a weekly program on the Think Tech Hawaii broadcast network. Ehana Kako, what does that mean? Well, many people have heard of a pule kako, let's pray together. Ehana Kako means let's work together. Let's work together to build a better economy, government, and society. And every week, Monday from 2 to 3 o'clock, you will see movers and shakers and other people who are working together to build a better economy government and society. Again, I'm Kili'i Akina on the Ehana Kako weekly program on the Think Tech Hawaii broadcast network. Aloha. See you here Mondays 2 to 3. Welcome back everybody. Ted Ralston here with our excellent cast of uh, specialists in <laughs> disaster management or emergency response and the uh, intelligent uh, proceedings associated with that here on Think Tech Hawaii, the, uh, where the path leads. And we're talking about the path uh, the path that's been paved is nice and, and has, has uh, sidewalls and all, it's a wonderful path. When it doesn't, isn't paved and the, and the barriers are, are up and there's holes in the pavement in that path, that's what we're talking about here. And, and you guys are talking about how we can fill that path, initially with information and data, and then follow that up with task orders and, and responses that go out and correct in some priority order. So we've had some discussion about the my Mercy system, and we now had a little demonstration about how it's useful for generating uh, local and uh, personal inventory. It could also be used to record the, the the emerging and marching change of events, such as the lava coming up, and people could stand outside and, and report back periodically what the status is of the various uh, fingers of lava. Then we have uh, Palantir, which Rubicon uses, which is more associated with a, a structured task force that has a, a task order and has a resources plan behind it and has some mission objective. Um, what's fascinating to me is how would you gain access to the information provided by Mercy? Uh, because it is more dynamic, perhaps, than the information you based your task force on. It. And how would we make that available? And secondly, how would the information that you collect be useful to the people at State Civil Defense, for example, for using Mercy as a way to perhaps um, <clears throat> provide a structure to what the Mercy data is all about? I mean, we have unstructured and structured data sets that are dealing with the same emerging <coughs> situation. Well, I mean, to use uh, Zelle, and what, yeah. uh, if I throw out the, the term steadfast, that is our name for okay. it. Um, to use that example, the crux of all the information and operations, and you know, at, at least as far as uh, combining and integrating information, was really the state civil defense and uh, state agencies for that, um, because they are, I mean, they are rightly so the lead for the overall recovery efforts for the state. Uh, that's where a lot of our information sharing, and we 
rebel now. We love that, that we're able to work so closely with uh, the state DOD, state civil defense, and other uh, local, national, uh, and sometimes as a part of the international organizations to, to uh, accomplish our mission. Sharing data, I mean, we don't, none of us, like, like hold on to data. I mean, there are some privacy issues when it comes to our personnel, but, I mean, and that's, but just not, that's, ain't, that's no different from, you know, anyone else. Uh, but other than that, it's, as far as sharing information to others to, to get the job done, that's, that's what's really important. And <clears throat> the state uh, government agencies have, have, is crucial to that because they have the resources to pull. Uh, we got support from the uh, Hawaiian Army National Guard, uh, from uh, the uh, other volunteer groups, uh, American Red Cross, uh, as well as uh, you know, the county and city of, of uh, Hawaii. So it was fantastic. And that's, I think that's, that's where the key part plays. They have the resources, they have the, uh, the personnel to help with that. So there is a common basis where these all come together, and again, we talked at the first session about the uh, unknown name, but the uh, Pacific Disaster Center's uh, common operating picture, so to speak, is a place this all comes together. So in the case of the emerging situation in Pahoa, what would the three of you individually perhaps suggest that maybe is like number one on your, on your hit parade of things that Pahoa ought to pay attention to or listen to from the, or take advantage of, of the type of technology and experience that we've got here that could be made available in the next two weeks uh, on site in Baha. Let me ask my responder to start with that. Oh, well, um, I, 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 I'm hesitant to say that they need this because it seems like I'm being a, a, a couch quarterback. So it's, uh, um, Honestly, one of the things that maybe, well, Puna is, is a very sparse region, a relatively sparse region. People are spread out, things, uh, I mean, part of the challenge was getting to certain locations and, and, and communications was also key. Sometimes, I mean, people were highly dependent on the cell tower uh, performance in order to communicate, period. Uh, it's, I think it's making sure that there's a uh, robust backbone, particularly for communication. Uh, there's only so much you can do for electrical lines, there's only so much you can do. I mean, I mean, ideally, utilities, all utilities should be protected. But, and barring that, I mean, the, that is limited by significant resources. But if, if there's a way to maintain a, a strong backbone for communication, that's when uh, other uh, other resources can be. That's when other resources can be contacted uh, and, and have a reach back to the other islands or even the, the larger island as a whole. Uh, to, to ask for help. Um, without communication, people don't know. People so that's a good respond. point. As, as wonderful as the applications may be, at some point in time they have to give information forward. Correct. And at some point in time the people who are affected have to be advised as to what's happening. To them. Right. So there is a strong need for robust and uh, uh, resilient communications right. in some way. <laughs> So that's, that's your, that that, your that's, view that's number right. one is yep. that we have Because from there, thinking when, about that. All right, once, the, once the flag's raised, that's when, I mean, that's kind of how we, I mean, we, our, even as a state organization, we had to, you know, we had a national organization to pull from, and that's where we got equipment, personnel, uh, change, that's where we got the chainsaw kits from. That's where we got the people to come to, to do the work, uh, and that's how we maintain our, our, our staffing personnel uh, in order to uh, see it through to people say, you know, we've, we've done enough. Um, and having, <clears throat> having access and means communication to ask for help, receive it, coordinate for its arrival, and to utilize it. Uh, that was, without that, uh, it wouldn't have been able to. So that's so. probably advice that's good for anyone in yes. the emergency yep. areas, not yep. just the whole but it's, uh, It scales yeah. down to the lowest yeah. level. Okay. So robust communication backbone. Interesting. Now, Clement, uh, Jung, who's going to speak at this table on the 26th about the Kailua readiness fair, well, I can only tell you what he's going to say, the same exact thing, <laughs> and he'll bring his radios to prove it, so that'll, that'll be great. So let me turn to the other end of the table, to Ian, and mm -hmm. ask the same thing. If this, what comes to your mind is something that would most benefit <coughs> the situation that's emerging in Baha from your I mean, um, point of view? I mean, I think of the same with John. It's, 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 it's. I think they're already doing a lot already. I think the, the, the most important part is the communications. The, you know, there's. It's hard to predict where things are gonna where things are gonna go, but um, I think the almost the daily updates that are coming from county civil defense and the communities and the gatherings and the 
Pahoa um, Lava Flow event that's tomorrow. Um, those kinds of events I think are really important because people are, I think there's a lot of fear. Um, you don't know, this is not like a storm that's, that's coming and then it's going away. It's a lava flow and it can continue possibly for a very long time and you know how do you prepare you know it's, it's moving slowly but fast enough and it could continue for, for quite a long time and how do you support the community um, through something that may last for potentially months or even years so uh, th I think that's the, the you know all I can say is, is better communications if there is um, you know, flexibility, communications, um, working together. I think the thing that happens in these kinds of situations is that everyone comes together. You know what the mission is. And it, even if you don't know the mission is, you can see it when you go outside and then you see the damage. So, I mean, from all the past work, everyone's done incredible things. I think there's a lot we've learned. And I think states of defense just coming out of Tropical Stone and Zell are, they're like, amazing, they're professional. I mean, they just know what to do because it just came out of one disaster and they're rolling into another one. And just try to stay connect, you know, connected to the community and, and just be responsive. Is, I think. So the term con communication in the sense you used it is a little bit different than the term that Josh. I was speaking of the technical problem or well, the backbone. Yeah, and that's true. I mean, information sharing is... Right, uh, yeah. and, and I think that's uh, actually that I was actually thinking of that too. I mean, it doesn't have to be being able to hook into Wi-Fi or even 4G or 3G. It's it's being able to say, pass along a message to the people that need it. Got it. That this is what this is what people need, want, uh, or this is the kind of help that people require. Whether it be it, it could be, you know, a carrier pigeon or a guy on a bicycle. Uh, it's. It's, it's getting that message to people that matter. So uh, it, as an operational guy, you said it best, uh, mm -hmm. pass along the message. Yeah. And that's, uh, that's interesting. The technical guys will get into what the structure of the message Thank is you. and how to packet it and this sort of thing. So David, let's turn to you and uh, throw that same question your way. In terms of if you could run the world, what would you do starting today to improve the situation or allow it to be as good as it can be coming up in a couple of weeks in the whole lot? I mean, I think you're expecting like a very technical solution. Both types of communication, and I would add to that also uh, some of the lessons learned is training. Mm -hmm. And there's like a lot of opportunities for additional training and, you know, it's just talking to uh, Carl Kim who has the National Disaster Preparedness Training Center. And I know they're committed to, and they do a lot of, you know, FEMA-based uh, training and they're actually, you know, taking the lessons learned from this to how to better structure their training uh, to the community and, you know, responders. So training's part of that information sharing, part of that communication, part of that connected with the community sense that both your uh, book ends <coughs> here came up with as uh, very important pieces. And it, it strikes me that uh, if we could take these community preparedness events, like the one tomorrow, and in uh, Monoa, the one on Kailua on the 27th. And if they could turn into, if they could have a clear and obvious um, effort to generate this sort of information sharing and community touch involvement, that would be a great addition to the, the total picture. Yeah. yeah, from the technical standpoint, yeah, we'll, we'll be sharing the My Mercy apps at, at these two readiness fairs in, in Pahoa and Manoa and then to the technical communication thing, you know, we'll be demonstrating an emergency pop-up phone and power system that we developed for the military. I've been uh, uh, commander here to go to Kailua as well. That's yes, and okay. I think uh, Jay Fidel, this this program last year or last week generated the Manoa yeah, connection, yeah. so yeah, we're and then the Kailua connection. So yeah. Jay, there's something valuable there in this program yeah. already. Absolutely. It's great to be part of it. So thank you very much for your excellent uh, and um, timely uh, commentary. I wish we could all run the world and push it all in the right direction. It's a, it's a tough push. But we heard great comments from Ian Kitajima, uh, David Takeyama, and John Chung on recent experiences in uh, Izel on the Big Island and what's to come up for us on the Big Island. And uh, again, as a last reminder, uh, Manoa tomorrow, 9 to 2 at the Manoa District Park. Kailua, 10 to 1 at, on the 27th at the center parking lot by uh, uh, Whole Foods in Kailua. 
uh, red Innis fares of the, you might call them conventional type, and one tomorrow that's going to be anything but conventional, which is is a heart wrencher. The Bahoa Lava Readiness Fair. Now that is that is something else, and it's testimony, by the way, to the state civil defense and the other people in the organ in the community who've come together, Rubicon and Ocean and others, who probably allowed that readiness fair tomorrow to happen. The uh, motivations and the experiences in the past have uh, uh, set the stage for that. Next. Friday, uh, Margie and I will be in um, Alaska. There's a UAV conference up there, and uh, we intend to uh, lasso a couple of UAV people and get them to the table up in Alaska and uh, join the conversation here by Skype. Uh, the subject will be uh, the technology and uh, needs that are the FAA sees as, as coming uh, requirements that must be settled in order to have systems such as this. Uh, perform the missions that you would like them to perform on a risk-free basis. So that'll be next Friday, and then the week after, uh, Clement uh, Jung from Kailua and some others will be here to talk about their readiness show. And by that time, of course, uh, the whole will be going off in a, in a in a big way, and perhaps some of the people are counting on actually will be on the other island. So maybe me. So uh, once again, thanks very much panel for coming down today and thank you to our audience and uh, Drew you might want to say a word to the audience about how they can get a hold of us give us questions that we'd like they'd like us to handle or even volunteer to come on the show you can always join us at www.thinkpetshawaii.com I'm not sure Drew you heard that <laughs> so at this point we'll just uh, wish everybody a good weekend and we'll see you next uh, Friday from Alaska fantastic thank you Thanks.